Last week we were talking about revisiting our crafting and our making goals for this year, since it's halfway through the year. And as I was attempting to clean out this attic, trying to figure out which things are going to stay here and which things are going to go to the new studio in the fall, I discovered and I stumbled upon the original printed off copy of my own Make 9 grid that I had created at the start of the year. And you can see up here in the middle of this grid is a little piece of tapestry weaving inspiration that I have done nothing about for the past six months, eh, up until now. Hi there, welcome. My name is Felicia from Sweet Georgia and this is Taking Back Friday. This is a space where we come every Friday and we talk about knitting and weaving and spinning. We talk about the fiber arts. I like to talk about how important it is to make time to make things. Now, we've been talking a little bit about Make Nine and what we were wanting to make for this year. And uh, like I said, these are the nine things that I was planning to make. Now, I have done a whole bunch of things. So I've done the woven sock scarves, I've done the sweater, I've done that sweater. I'm currently spinning the yarn for this shift cowl. I'm currently knitting a pair of hand spun socks, which is fun and new right now. Um, but there's a couple of other squares on here that I haven't touched yet. Two of them are sewing projects, so I'm not sure about those. Maybe that will come later on in the fall sewing projects. I used to sew all my own clothes and I haven't done that for many, many, many years. And so I was thinking about using hand woven fabric to sew into clothes, but that's something that I might swap out for other knitting projects. In any case, there's two other squares up here that are very important squares. This one is the tapestry weaving and the other one is a crook bracket. Crook bracket. These two things I want to do this year absolutely, definitely, most positively going to do these two this year. Now, as I've talked about before with juggling time and crafts and all these things that we like to do with the fiber arts, I've come to think of it this way, that everything to do with the fiber arts is along a continuum. It's a journey. It's the transformation of something that is a raw material that either comes off of an animal or is harvested from a plant, but that raw material is then processed. It has to be dyed. It has to be spun. It's created into yarn. And then that yarn can then be used in knitting or crochet or weaving on on a rigid head loom or a floor loom or a frame loom or a tapestry loom. So the way that I approach this continuum of the fiber arts is that I move through this journey uh, through different seasons of the year. So in one season, it might make sense to do a lot of knitting at home and, you know, staying under the covers and being cozy and spending a lot of time knitting. It might be another season where I really, really want to spend all that time spinning. Or there might be another season, like summertime, when it makes sense to spend a lot of time outside doing dyeing work. So I move through all of these crafts with different seasons. So I never feel like I'm neglecting one or like I'm not a spinner because I haven't spun for four months. I don't ever feel like that. I feel like I do all of these things. I just do them all at different times when it's appropriate, when it's the right context for it. And so with the tapestry weaving, it never felt like it was the right time. I was always busy with other things. There's also one more thing, and it was because I didn't feel like I had the right tools. And I've talked about this before as well, about how I believe very strongly that it's important to invest in good tools. Good tools will help make the job so much easier. And so I have dabbled in some frame loom weaving over the years because it's fun to do. And so, you know, I had got a frame loom from Knit City at the time. Um, this one is made by Woven Wood Goods. I don't know if she makes them anymore. She was on Etsy. She was making them. Um, but they're beautiful, beautiful looms, but they have some limitations. I mean, it's very simple. You could make your own with some, some nails and some sticks of wood. Absolutely, you could do that. Um, but one of the challenges is that it's a little bit difficult to get very tight tension on this warp for weaving. So you can see I'm experimenting a little bit with this crook uh sort of technique as well, very manually trying to figure it out. The other thing about working with these frame loom weavings is um, 
In watching Jana Maria teach this course for Tapestry Weaving for the School of Sweet Georgia, I was there at her studio watching her teach this course. I was filming it together with Leah, so Leah's also been quite inspired by the tapestry weaving. Um, she, <laughs> she's gone down a whole rabbit hole there. She got herself a Murex loom. She's doing a ton of weaving right now as well. We're just both very inspired by this tapestry weaving technique. But one of the things that I discovered from Jana is how important it is to use the proper techniques to weave tapestry. And so with this, you know, this wall hanging that I made, um, maybe a couple years ago, I went to a retreat where I learned how to do this and we got looms and we played with it. And part of the retreat is to be relaxed and to not to have a care in the world and to do whatever you want, whenever you want. And so it's expressed in the weaving. And so the weaving goes by no rules at all, kind of like doing whatever you want. I sort of mushed the yarn back and forth into like curves and waves and all sorts of things like that in order to create shapes. These these shapes are not um, very secure. Um, <laughs> I also popped in a whole bunch of fiber, which is like really fun and really fun to look at. But you can see that from the cloth, it's like, it's not flat. It has weird bubbles to it. Um, it has a weird shape to the side of it. Um, the, the fabric itself is quite sleazy, which is like, uh, it means that it's not very stable. It's not very secure. I could theoretically stick my finger through here and poke a hole in the fabric, which is not what you want in any kind of cloth that you're weaving. So there's all sorts of structural issues with something like this. Um, even though it's very cute and it's nice to look at and it's super fun to make, um, there are definitely techniques that you can use to make sure that what you're making is structurally sound. You can have that graphic you know, design the look that you want, the colors that you want, you want to do blending, you want to do all sorts of things. All of that stuff is possible when you also do the right techniques. And so that's what I've been inspired to try learning from Jana. So this is the actual sample that Jana wove for the class that we did. And I still have it in my possession, which is odd since I should probably return it to her. It's been probably about a year now. Uh, but yeah, this is something that I should probably hand back to her. But this, this little piece has inspired me so much that um, this is one of the things that I wanna do this year. Now, it was never the right time because I didn't really have a tapestry loom. I'm working with a frame loom. It's not very much tension, but I caught wind of something that was coming. Ta-da! <laughs> so this is a new, brand new tapestry loom from Shaq. Shaq Spindle, who makes uh, the cherry matchless that I spin on. It makes the baby wolf loom that I weave on. Um, it just makes beautiful, beautiful things. I use their end feed shuttle. I use their boat shuttles. And now, I'm trying out their tapestry loom. So this new tapestry loom is called the Eris Tapestry Loom, and it has all sorts of fun features that make it much easier to weave tapestry. One of the things that we noticed when we, when Lee and I were observing Jana teach her tapestry course is that she has these beautiful Murex looms that have this crazy amazing shedding device. So when you use a frame loom, one of the things that you'll have to do is kind of weave back and forth manually with a needle uh, to, to, to weave your weft yarn into this cloth. You can do a shortcut where you use a pickup stick and you pick up sort of every other th warp thread and then you can flip up your warp uh, or your pickup stick and it makes a shed but it only makes a shed in one direction yeah. and so you're getting a little bit of efficiency but not that much efficiency but with a shedding device on a tapestry loom it's amazing <laughs> It just, it just creates an opening for you so that it's easy for you to do the weaving. And so the Murex loom has one that goes back and forth and it's a beautiful shedding device. This new Eris loom also has this shedding device. So you can see this handle here. There are heddles that are basically um, attached to each of these warp threads. And so half of the heddles are attached to every other warp thread, and then the other heddles on the bottom bar here are attached to all of the other, all of the other warp threads, the ones that are not caught by the first set. So that way, when you turn this handle back and forth, it causes the shed to open and close. So I had kind of done this on my own with this little experimental frame loom. You can see here, 
I made my own string heddles uh, with just some colored yarn and stuff like that. And uh, because this particular pattern to do the crook brad is not uh, every other warp thread, it was a little bit more complicated than that. So I think it's like uh, one and then skip three and then one and skip three. And so I made these string heddles so that I could pull up different sets of, uh, different sets of warp threads at a time. So yeah, it's basically the same idea. You're just tying a loop of yarn around a warp thread so that you can pull it forward and create an opening there. So the shedding device is probably one of the most exciting things about this particular loom, just so that it helps create that efficiency both ways. The other thing that's very, very important that I mentioned about the frame loom not having is the ability to add tension. So Shaft has actually put together a series of very, very concise, very clear videos about how to assemble the loom, how to warp the loom, how to set up the loom, all this stuff. And so in listening to uh, Jane Patrick describe how the loom needs to be set up and how tight this tension needs to be for the warp threads, she said it needs to be as tight as guitar strings. That's what it should feel like. You can even hear it. So at the top of this loom here, there's actually two bars that is a tension bar. And so it holds the top of the, the warp and then you can raise or lower this particular bar with some like little pegs to twist them up and down. And that adds or releases tension on the warp. And so it is great to be able to set this all up and then to be able to add tension afterwards so that it's exactly what you need in order to do some really efficient weaving. The other thing that I found that was really clever is these things. So the loom ships with four of these little springs. They look like a uh, spiral binding rings from, you know, when we used to uh, coil bind papers together, you know. I used to work at a photocopy shop when I was in university, so this was, yeah. <laughs> So these are all cut to different lengths. They look like they have about the same amount of spiral to them. They're, they're basically all the same, except that they're cut to different lengths. And now when you take these lengths and you put them on the rod that is up here in the loom, they basically squish down and uh, create different densities. So the coils themselves will squeeze together and then the gaps between the coils will be different sizes. Now this, is basically your read. This determines how close or how far apart your warp ends are going to be. So it's very cute, it's very clever. So there's a couple of other things I wanted to point out about this particular loom that I really appreciate is obviously like this shedding device slides up and down. It's not in a fixed position anywhere. So as your weaving is traveling up the loom, you could, if you wanted to, slide the shedding device up as well to make uh, your shed a little bit bigger. Of course, you could also loosen your warp and advance the whole thing. So basically the, um, the whole weaving is wound on a continuous warp. So basically this this whole warp goes underneath here and it goes over the loom and to the back of the loom. So as this is being woven, I can slide this down and then slide up more of this warp that's in the back here and then kind of just keep shifting it, keep shifting it so that I keep working in this particular area. This shedding device can also move up and down as you need it in order to uh, help facilitate your shed. The other thing that I found that is really helpful about this too is that there's a bunch of different positions that you can put your loom in. So you can have it tilted slightly backwards uh, so that it's it's leaning, it's, it's well supported on the back with this leg here, but it's leaning back so that you can see your work a little bit better. So that's all been fantastic. I, I warped this up, maybe I assembled it a couple nights ago and it took about an hour to assemble. Um, I had watched the video and assembled it. And then probably another night took another hour or so for me to figure out how to warp the loom. So I'm just using 4.8 cotton or 8.4 cotton right now just for this particular warp because I have it lying around. And um, so that's what I'm sort of playing with right now. And then it probably took another hour or so to weave this little chunk of uh, sample down here. So the weaving, because it is weft faced and you're using a tapestry beater, this is one that was sort of given to me through like other used equipment and stuff like that. I, I inherited this through other looms and things. Uh, but this is a Leclerc tapestry beater. So you're beating down all your weft yarn with the beater and it 
packs it all in super tight so that the warp threads are not visible at all. And it's making quite a firm fabric down here. The yarn that I'm using is actually the BFL and Silk DK yarn that I have. I have all this leftover yarn that I just keep in a bag here. And so I'm just using the leftovers as sample yarn right now just to test out the techniques, figure out the techniques. And then once I figure out how it all works, then I'm going to make an actual proper piece that's probably a little bit wider than what I have here. But this is just a sample. And so for the sample, I wanted to test that technique that Jana has here. So in this case, she was using fingering weight yarn. The yarn I'm using here is a little bit thicker. Uh, so you can sort of see those lines uh, more strongly, but it is a technique where you're taking two colors and then blending them together in the middle. And so as they blend together like this, they form a third color. It's optical mixing, it's optical color mixing. So those two colors blend together, mix in the middle and form another color. And so this is a technique that they use uh, called hatching and it is to add shading and add, you know, mixing and blending of colors in your work. So I'm just testing out what that is and then trying to sort of variegate from one color to the next color and see how that goes. Once this little chunk is done, I think I'm going to pull out the mop cotton that I dyed for the fiber reactive class last summer. And I'm going to try that and see how that functions at this particular set. I'm going to try some other yarns, do a lot of testing. This is my sampler. So I'm going to put in a whole bunch of different yarns, see how they react at this set. And you know, if I wanted to, what I could do is I could loosen the warp and then pop out this spring and then put in a different spring, a different set, and then just readjust all of my uh, warp threads and kind of go from there as well. I think that it's quite flexible. Um, yeah. Probably a couple of weeks ago, we had Jana do a second workshop for us on Zoom, and she talked specifically about weaving stripes. And so I was watching her, we did like a run through beforehand, and then watching her during the actual workshop, watching her with the little tapestry beater, and then that tick, 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 tick sound as you're weaving and beating that weft yarn in. It's just so soothing and very relaxing, very meditative. And uh, yeah, so I'm quite enjoying this. It's very slow going but very fun, very satisfying. The last thing that Janice sort of changed me over, changed my thinking over, is this whole idea of weaving from the back, weaving backwards. So the way that she uh, teaches is that you weave and all of your ends are sticking out the, this side, um, and then your actual finished cloth is gonna be on the other side. It's mind boggling to me. I always do my work looking at the front side. Um, I know there are some weavers, even on floor looms, who leave their ends facing out towards them so that they can see them, and that would be the back side of the cloth. Uh, but I always weave looking at the thing that I want to look at. So this has been sort of a, a mind shift that I've had to go through uh, to be weaving from the back. <laughs> So the last thing is that this loom has a weaving width of 20 inches. So let's see, that's this big. It seems like it's really big. I put it next to my baby wolf and it's about almost quite close to the width of the baby wolf loom and um, about as high as up to the back beam. So it's not a tiny loom. Um, it doesn't come in other sizes. This is the size, but I feel like it's extremely flexible. One of the uh, interesting things that I've also seen about tapestry is that you could set up more than one project at a time. So you could have this warped up here and then you could have like a much smaller, much narrower, little tiny baby warp going on on this side and you weave them completely independently so you could have multiple projects all at the same time maybe you weave them as a triptych so you're designing them so that they will be placed on the wall at you know together side by side at the same time or maybe you set them up at different sets and maybe this is like a main project and maybe one of these side things could be like a daily tapestry diary where you just weave a little inch of something and then the next day you weave an inch of something it could be lots of different things that you could do. I am curious to hear if any of you guys have this loom, if you guys have seen this loom, if you are doing any tapestry weaving, uh, if you're interested in tapestry weaving. It just, to me, it seems like a new and different way to use the yarns that we already have and to use them in a very graphic way. You can create beautiful designs. It's about color combination. It's about shape. It's about hierarchy of, you know, colors and all these kinds of things. So 
there's definitely a lot of things that you can, a lot of aspects of color and texture that you can explore with a technique like this, and especially when you have a foundation of good technique, which is what Jana is teaching. So yeah, if you're at all interested in learning tapestry, Jana has that course, it's a very comprehensive course. It's several hours long. Yeah, I can't remember how many hours, but we said it was a several hours of tapestry weaving with Jana, and that is on the School of Sweet Georgia. You can find it there. And then she also has that follow-up workshop on Zoom. And hopefully if we can start traveling around BC very soon, we can start to uh, travel out and visit her at her studio in Sunshine Coast, or maybe she'll come down to Vancouver and we can keep doing this because this is actually really fun. So that is basically it for today. I would love to hear from you if you do tapestry, if you have done tapestry, if you do frame loom weaving, what your experience has been around this, or if maybe you're like a little bit curious about what this is all about. I would love to hear your thoughts on this. Thank you so much for watching this episode. If you like this episode, please do hit the like button. And if you would like to see more content about the fiber arts, please do hit subscribe. We try to come here every Friday to talk about yarn and color and craft and all these wonderful happy things. Thank you so much for being here and I will see you in the next one. Bye for now. Push, like that? Yeah, good. Oh, that's